Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Morales. I'm at the Heart Rhythm Society Conference and I have the honor of talking with Dr. Miguel Valderavano. Dr. Valderavano is an electrophysiologist based out of Houston, Texas, which I've actually known for several years. Dr. Valderavano, thank you for taking the time out to interview for Dr. My, my so, pleasure. So today we're going to talk about what happens when an ablation doesn't work. Okay, There's a lot of patients out there, or they may hear from other doctors say, ablation doesn't work. And we know that the success rates from ablations aren't perfect. And so there are many people out there who get an ablation done and then it comes back and the AFib comes back or there's not the success that people want and so what sort of the first steps if you meet people who have had an ablation that doesn't work you know how do you start counseling people on that so uh, first you want to talk about this before you do the ablation mm -hmm. this cannot be a surprise uh, for the patient when you do an ablation they need to know that a certain amount of patients are going to need to have a touch-up or need for, for a new visit to the ablation uh, catheter lab, right? Um, first, uh, I would distinguish early failures. So patients that have an ablation and then the next week they're in AFib, they need to be reassured that sometimes it's just a matter of, of tissue healing yeah. and the acute inflammation of the ablation has to be has to settle down and a scar has to be formed and only when that scar has completed that's when we say okay did we fail did we not fail? once we talk about beyond that acute period which is up to three months then uh if the ablation didn't work and the patient is having symptoms i i divide the failures in two kinds one is a technical failure meaning when we did the ablation we tried to get pulmonary vein isolation mm -hmm. we ablate the areas where AFib is supposed to harbor, where the triggers for AFib are coming from. And the goal is to achieve pulmonary vein isolation and some patients, they have reconnection of the mm -hmm. pulmonary veins. Whether tissue grows back or the ablation was not as thorough as we intended it to be, they have a technical failure of pulmonary, ve pulmonary vein isolation. The pulmonary veins are not isolated. So that simply needs to be redone. The other kind of failures are what I like to call mechanistic failures. So you may have a perfectly well done pulmonary vein isolation, but it turns out that in that patient, the AFib comes from somewhere else. Yeah. Then, then we need to get smarter. Mm -hmm. Then we need to look for other triggers. It's, it's, you know, a trigger like the vein of Marshall, the superior vena cava. Where is this AFib coming from in this particular patient in which I have achieved PV isolation and yet they still have AFib? And then a third kind is flutters. Mm -hmm. Patients may come back with, uh, Flutter, for the lay people, is, is a regular electricity, usually spinning electricity regularly somewhere around the atria. Those patients have a very easy second procedure. Right. Just we map and we find where the electricity spins. We do a smart ablation guided by the activation patterns and we succeed. Now, there are some patients out there that have had three, four ablations done and it's still suboptimal. And in those types of patients, are the, I know that you do a lot of research protocols. Is there something that people should look out for that's maybe out of the unusual, out of the usual? You know, you know, when should be somebody really be looking at an academic medical center, somebody that does research protocols? Things are a little bit out of the usual box. So, um, I mean, I think, I think uh, in the community, two procedures should be enough. A competent operator like yourself. Mm -hmm guarantee that in two procedures the pulmonary veins are going to be isolated mm -hmm. and you can perhaps include the posterior wall mm -hmm. in some patients but if that hasn't worked typically it's patients with persistent AFib sometimes long time in persistent AFib you may need to explore other triggers like we talked about we, we did a lot of research together in the vein of Marshall alcohol that's a, that's a source of triggers for AFib that does not normally get ablated mm -hmm. with standard RF because it's so much in the outer surface of yes, the heart uh -huh. um, appendix isolation. So you may need to ablate so extensively that you disconnect electricity from the appendage and that is very controversial. Everybody has their own opinions, yes. but it could have it has been linked to a higher risk of stroke, even higher than plain AFib. Mm -hmm. And if you're ready to do appendix isolation, which is not technically that easy, um, you should be ready to close that appendage with an occlusion device. Sure. So that's when the complexity escalates. And then for sure there's very rare cases that have a right atrial origin. And that requires the patients to map and be, you know, to, to spend time in, in mapping every single corner of the atria, figuring out where the AFib is coming in that patient. And that takes sometimes multiple hours of a procedure. 
Is there any any point where you say to patients, you know what, we cannot do any more ablations, you've had enough, there's no there's no more that we can do? Um, as I get older, it gets less and less. Uh -huh. I guess I'm more confident in, in being able to always, because in most most of my, my experience, when someone has had two, three ablations, the tough ones will have every now and then a flutter here and there. And uh, flutter here and there, you know, you may still be able to map. So what is the number, the maximum number of ablations that I've ever done in a patient? I'm embarrassed to say, but I think I've one patient, not entirely all of mine, but I have one patient that had six ablations, wow. of which I did four. But the last three were flutters. Right. And sometimes the flutters come from uh, septal areas, close to sometimes the coni sinus system, close to the uh, AV node. Then you get even more risk. Right. So it's... And I think another point to point out is that AFib is a progressive condition. Even if somebody has a very good ablation, everything's done well, years later, as they age or other comorbidities develop, they may develop new areas that yeah. weren't ablated the first time, and that's why things need to be readdressed. Well, yeah. well Dr. Valero, I really appreciate you coming by, taking a few minutes of your time. Thank My you pleasure. for being here. All right. Thank you.